Hey, thank you very much. And uh, it's so good to see everybody flashing into the Zoom uh, room this evening. Um, we're really excited tonight to have another episode of our weekly DEF video series. Uh, my name is Joe Gorelick, and I am the president of the Dermatology Education Foundation. Tonight, we have a great opportunity to circle back and revisit our discussions with our nurse practitioner and physician assistant leaders in the field of dermatology who are really kind to rejoin us uh, tonight to share their experiences of their return to work or their plan to re their planned return to work full time in their practices. So we're happy to be joined this evening by TJ Chow, a returning panelist to discuss the reopening of his Georgia based practice. Welcome TJ, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for having me, Joe. Please also welcome Leanne Ponch. Uh, Leanne's one of our uh, DEF Advisory Council members and she practices in a large group practice in Ohio. And she'll be discussing her return to seeing patients. She's gonna share some of her best practices that she's learned uh, through telemedicine as we've been thrust into it uh, and give us a coding update on telemedicine. So Leanne, thank you for joining us again. Thanks for having me. And last but not least, uh, Kara Gooding, physician assistant, a DEF advisory council member who practices in Arizona. And she's transitioning back into a new sort of regular patient care, care schedule in her practice. And she's gonna share uh, those experiences with, with us as well. So Kara, thank you for being here tonight. Thanks, Joe. Tonight, we're also uh, very excited to share our preliminary results from the DEF Dermatology Nurse Practitioner and Physician Assistant Survey. Uh, we sent this survey out uh, a week or so ago, and we're gonna share some of the preliminary results um, from our respondents that came in throughout the country as they shared their employment situations and other information. So I'm excited to share these results with you. Just some general uh, housekeeping information as we go through tonight. Please remember to continue to follow the guidance provided to you by your practices and your state and local governments uh, as our situation still remains very fluid. Uh, please adhere to collaborative agreements, supervising physicians and our state and licensing boards uh, as we transition into the new normal during the COVID-19 pandemic. After the, um, the meeting, we'll uh, put together a summary and we'll uh, post it on the blog page, uh, any references that we NPPA.org. And while everyone's muted during the, uh, the participants are all muted during the call, please submit questions through the chat box uh, as we uh, described earlier, and we'll try and get to them, to them throughout the call. Uh, if we're not able to, we'll try and um, get to them uh, potentially through, the, um, through our blog page or we'll address them in next week's meeting. Your input is incredibly valuable and your input uh, is what guides our topics uh, week to week. So uh, having said that, let's jump into the survey results and discuss what we've learned really from many of you. Let's uh, get the first slide up here. Let me adjust my Zoom screen so I can see it. So you can see this is a survey that was distributed to practicing nurse practitioners and physician assistants in the US. Uh, and it was uh, very well uh, responded to the distribution uh, of nurse practitioners and physician assistants was 4060 uh, with around 250 total um, total um, respondents. So let's get a look at their, just gonna move this little box out of the way here. Good. Okay, let's take a look at the next slide. So the question was, for those of you who are working, um, what's your schedule like? And here you can see um, almost 70% of us have had reduced working hours. Um, and 30% of us were still working uh, full time. That was as of a week ago. We'll redo this down the road and see where we are. But you can see as nurse practitioners and physician assistants in dermatology, we were dramatically affected um, by the COVID-19 crisis in terms of our employment. Next slide. So for those of us or those of you that were not working, um, what, was, what did this situation look like? 76% of, of uh, nurse practitioner and physician assistants were actually 
furloughed from your practice. It's really unimaginable if you think about four months back and how busy uh, and um, rampantly we were seeing patients through the end of the year and into the beginning of the year and how busy we were uh, to have 76% of people that were um, reduced, having their hours reduced, being furloughed. And then um, a good 25% was late, were laid off. So uh, this is a big issue for us in dermatology as nurse practitioners and physician assistants. It's really important that we share this information with each other and that we collectively figure out best practices and resources so that we can figure out a way to get everybody back to work and busy in our practices so we can recover the income that some of us have lost and also just be there to take care of our patients as our practices uh, normalize. Next slide. So um, how, what's the experience level of the NPs and the PAs that were surveyed? Um, this is really a representative of the uh, breadth and reach of the Dermatology Education Foundation and the resources we provide. You can see that your colleagues are very experienced with over half of us being in practice from, for over 13 years. So this audience is well rooted in dermatology. A quarter of us uh, have been in the field for uh, up to six years and then um, another quarter, seven to 12 years. So we really have a lot of experience for this group of nurse practitioners and physician assistants. So the question was, how has your office been affected by the COVID-19 crisis for medical dermatology patients? Let's take a look at the answers. So you can see here that 50% of people uh, remained open to new and existing patients, but only in emergency situations. And um, as you'll see as a theme here, they're taking virtual appointments also. So that's half of us. 25% were open to all patients, but started taking virtual appointments. And that was a new thing. And then um, as you go down to 8%, um, they were completely closed and seeing new patients by virtual appointment only, as well as existing patients. And then some patients, some practices were completely closed and not seeing practice patients at all. Luckily, um, as you can see, that's only 6%, and then 4% had um, open to all patients and not taking any virtual appointments. So really the majority of practices stayed open in some fashion to care for their existing patient base and incorporated uh, virtual telemedicine uh, or teledermatology. Next slide. So if you are seeing patients through teledermatology or telehealth visits, where are you doing that from? Are you doing it at home? Well, 35% of people are, but the majority of us are doing it in the office. And this is very interesting and it speaks to the different platforms and um, systems that we use in our office for electronic medical records or not. Um, it also speaks to having the information you need in front of you to take care of patients in a way uh, where you're not gonna increase your risk for potential uh, lawsuits and malpractice because uh, during the pandemic, uh, none of that is gonna slow down. So it's really important that whether you're at home or you're in the office, you have the resources you need to see the patient's full information so you know their medication allergies and what medications are currently on. So um, interesting mix of at home and in office. Next slide. So what platform are you using? So as we got thrust into teledermatology, um, some of us had existing Medical, electronic medical rest record um, systems that were able to morph into um, telehealth and perform teledermatology. Yet when you look at the top five responses, what you can see here uh, going from the top portion of your screen diagonally down, the number one platform used was FaceTime, followed by Doc, DocsyMe and Zoom, and then uh, Emma, Modernizing Medicine. And then uh, Skype was the fifth most response. So this is interesting when you look at it and you see uh, what dermatology practitioners uh, relied on or went to to take care of our patients. And a lot of this um, was um, because Medicare and uh, Medicare actually allowed us to use 
different platforms than our electronic medical records. Without using these other platforms, we would have huge patient bases that we would not be able to care for. So it really is interesting to see these platforms. And as we move forward and we enter the new normal, it's really going to be very interesting to see which of these platforms are going to be sustainable and can be done in a HIPAA compliant way as um, the restrictions sort of tighten up. So how many patients are you seeing virtually each day? So think about it. Again, if you go back six months, a lot of us were seeing no patients. Probably most of us were seeing no patients virtually. And here you can see on the top bar, 40% um, of people are seeing just a few patients, um, but you have a good uh, another 40% of us that are seeing five to 15 patients um, a day virtually. And that's really where the, uh, the majority of um, this lies. So telemedicine is definitely something that we're doing now. And I think as nurse practitioners and physician assistants, we really have an opportunity to be um, leaders in the field of it. And I think that in some degree in our practices, this is something that we may be responsible for. Next slide. So we asked you what were the most common things that you were seeing in practice, either virtually or patients coming into the office. And here they are. So acne and then dermatitis of some sort. Um, patients do not stop getting suspicious lesions. Uh, May is melanoma month and melanoma does not shelter in place. So people have new lesions and changing lesions and we're seeing those but acne, dermatitis or rashes, suspicious lesions, um, and patients' um, need for their medications and the refills did not stop with the COVID-19 crisis. So we were busy with that, um, busy taking care of patients that we had performed surgeries on and followed by rosacea and psoriasis. So these are the patients um, that continued to need our care during this crisis. Slide. So there'll be more to come as we crunch more of the data and we send out um, and we can dispense some more of the, um, the survey results to you. Um, next slide. Okay, there we go. So what we also did is we asked the um, respondents, and probably many of you did respond, um, what sort of topics did you wanna see for our upcoming webinars? And that's really what guides us. So please continue to send in your suggestions and we'll build them into the following weeks uh, for our topics. Um, so some of our advisory council and our panelists have ideas and if they correspond and um, coincide with what uh, the audience is looking for, then we can absolutely fulfill those requests. So we're now gonna transition into getting some personal experiences from, one, from our panel. Um, over the past few weeks, uh, we have started to see patients again. Some of us were all the way shut down and some of us started up again. And so let's start off with you, TJ. Uh, TJ, thanks again for joining us. Um, can you tell us a bit about what your new normal looks like in your Georgia-based practice? Sure, sure. So uh, I began seeing uh, more patients a couple weeks ago. We were going to do a hard open and it turned into a soft open um, in a couple weeks ago when the governor of Georgia opened up the state. And part of the reason why it turned into a soft opening, honestly, is we were surprised by staff not willing to come back to work. Um, you know, apparently some of the staff, uh, the ones that aren't come, wanting to come back to work um, are actually making more money staying home. So that's, that's a, an issue that we're dealing with. Um, and that goes through the end of July, by the way, um, where they'll be getting paid extra to stay home rather than work. So that might be something that you all might be facing um, as you come back to your office. And, and what that's done is it's, it's kind of hamstrung us in, into kind of controlling what we're seeing and what we're allowing in the practice. Um, so the last couple of weeks, we've, you know, we've shifted from all telederm to the first week, it was maybe 40% in office, 60% telederm. This week is more 60% in office, 40% telederm. And next week, 
we're going to go like 97% in office and 3% Teladerm. And I'm, I'm trying to keep a lot of these Teladerm appointments that we've been seeing as Teladerm because I have found that it's, it is actually making things run a little bit more efficiently. This week, um, you know, I, I, I was only, I've only seen about 35 patients a day this week. Normally, I see 50 to 55. Um, so this week, I've been able to toggle between Teladerm um, and in-office visits pretty easily because my MAs have helped me to do that. So I have found that um, Dupixent follow-ups, for example, certain biologic follow-ups, rosacea, Accutane, acne, um, a, a lot of those visits can be done effectively on Teladerm. And it's, um, you, it, the billing's about the same if you look at the, the reimbursement. Um, and it keeps the patients out of your office. So, so that's, that's been a benefit. Um, but for all of us, it's gonna be a challenge. You, you all have to decide, are you gonna do a block of patients that's gonna be Teladerm, or are you gonna mix your Teladerm into your regular day or your regular routine? And I, I think it's a question that we're, we're all gonna have to, to face eventually. Um, some of the things that we've also been challenging, you, we're not really seeing a new normal anytime soon. And you know, every time I think about it, I think it's gonna be, okay, it'll be a couple months, and then next it's four months, and you know, maybe it's gonna really be a year, but um, we have staff that don't wanna come back till the end of July. We have staff that wanna, uh, you know, they're not sure if they're gonna come back ever. So that, that's been, that's been a, a big problem. We're also having problems with patients who, for example, before all this happened, had we found invasive squamous cell or melanoma on them, uh, uh, in situ melanoma, and we didn't do the surgeries. We followed the AED guidelines. Um, our most surgeons didn't do any sur surgeries. So now we're calling these patients to come back and some of them are very hesitant. So we're literally having to recenter these patients and explain to them that the risk of staying home at this point is worse than, um, than coming in. So uh, we've set up our office completely for safety precautions. We, we all wear the masks. We have plexiglass everywhere. Our office is full of plexiglass. Uh, everyone is gowned. Uh, they try to get me to wear a hairnet, but I won't wear a ha hairnet. Uh, but you know, we every interaction that we do is 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 with intention, and and that's what you're going to be coming back to if if you're out of the office. So, unfortunately, this is going to be like this for a while. We're not going to have a vaccine for a year, likely, and so this is what it may be like for the next year. Uh, but there are there are some things that you guys might might run into that you're not expecting, such as staff not wanting to come back, patients not wanting to come in. Um, one thing that really worked well for us is. Uh, this week, two, yesterday, we are one of our nurses and one of our doctors created a video um, explaining our safety uh, measures that we've done in our office. It was a YouTube video, and you can go to atlantanorthdermatology.com and see that video. And basically, we have a nurse explaining all of our safety uh, measures that we, we've done. We sent out that video to our entire um, email database. And I'm telling you, our, my office manager flipped out. We had about 30 phone calls for, with people trying to get in to do skin exams. So what I can tell you is the demand is there. Um, we, we haven't done full skin exams and we're starting to do them next week. Um, and you know, I, I, what's positive is there is demand. Um, one of my concerns was our patients can be able to afford their visits are, we have 16% unemployment right now in the country, you know, but a lot of these patients have retained their insurance. So that's the good news right now. We'll see how that goes, but um, we have had some patients say, I can't afford it. And we've had to negotiate with them, but um, overall, it's not as bad as what I had imagined. And the demand is, it is greater than what I imagined. In fact, Monday morning, I'm going to be in trouble because we have inadequate staff to see the number of patients that I have scheduled. All of us do, all the providers. So that's something you all might have to deal with when you get back. So, uh, but we'll take it. We'll, we'll, I'll do the necessary steps in order to make this work out, so. That's great. TJ, you know, thank you for sharing with us those, you know, potential obstacles that maybe we would not have seen. And um, I can tell you um, our practice has been open and when patients come into the practice, they really appreciate the steps that are being taken to make them safe. They appreciate uh, having their temperature taken. They appreciate the hand washing stations before they come in. 
They appreciate that there's not many chairs in the waiting room and that they can wait in their car and we can call them in. And they thank us for providing a safe environment. So um, I'm glad to see that you feel <clears throat> as though the patients are there, the demand is there, and that soon we can be busy again. So um, one more please, thing, Joe, yeah, on on, uh, on that point, you were talking about taking the temperature. Um, that can be implemented in, in part of the billing. Uh, Leanne might be able to speak about that a little bit more, but that that is a measure that um, can be used to to cover yourself in your billing codes, just so you know. Very good. Thank you, TJ. I like that. Um, so please, if you have additional questions for TJ, um, send them in to us uh, through the Zoom chat box and we'll try and get to them at, as we um, um, get towards the end of the hour. Um, we wanna keep things moving here and we wanna switch and transition, if you will, um, with a beautiful segue from TJ to Leanne. Um, so we wanna talk uh, and ask Leanne um, a, a bit about practical telemedicine pearls and updates um, that she's discovered. She's become our uh, DEF expert in um, telemedicine. So Leanne, uh, we've all uh, been watching the AAD and their guidance on telehealth services, including uh, the indication that only audio or audio only telemedicine visits exclusively will be reimbursed at the same rate as existing office visits during this time and when you know, they're coded appropriately. Um, we saw they also did an update on May 1st, 2020. So can you tell us a little bit about the coding updates that have come our way? Absolutely. So in essence, what we have here is CMS, which really is gonna dictate what all the other insurers do, um, indicating that we can either bill uh, a phone call even with medical decision-making or we can bill by time. And so if we were to look at that a little bit detailed, um, you can see that in essence, uh, decision-making for a diagnosed problem might in fact be easier than a decision-making for an identified but undiagnosed problem or an existing problem that's flared, um, any, any problem that would require us to order tests or consult another provider might also add added dimensions and really, um, in essence, beef up our thought processes behind what goes into these visits. And I think really, when you think about it, um, you know, this can be simplified by time, um, but it's really, really important to detail all of the pieces and the layers if you're gonna bill um, in medical decision-making, including things like how many problems did you address? Um, what is their complexity? and what types of decisions did you make for each of those problems. If you're gonna bill by time, it's really important that you have some sort of a detailed note about your face-to-face -face time with the patient or in essence, ear to ear. Um, and those types of things can be added to your additional consent um, for allowing the visit. Can I ask a, a question? Um, and just wanna remind everyone that in the chat session or in the chat box, uh, there is a, a file that you can download that uh, has some of these details in it. So Leanne, I think a lot of us are trying to decide what, which way do we go? Do we just write, like for instance, my practice, we use Zoom. Um, and for every visit, telehealth visit that I do, I write Zoom and then 15 minutes um, or however long it is. And is that adequate if you're gonna bill by time? So, you know, in, in most of the visits that we're doing, a lot of times they're set up and maybe there's some time face-to-face -face with our front staff, some face-to-face -face with maybe our medical assistants. If you're going to bill for time, you have to really count clocks and count minutes of face-to-face -face interaction with your patient. And so if you were having a detailed discussion about their diagnosis, their flair, what are the possible treatments, all of the decisions that go into um, what they choose for a, a specific treatment, and you actually had 15 minutes of face-to-face -face or ear-to-ear -ear time, then absolutely you can bill by time. Um, but most of us don't have that much for each, for each patient. 
And if you do the, the time, the intake, oftentimes is done by uh, medical assistants in the offices, that counts towards that time, is that correct? No, it's face-to-face -face with the provider. And that's what you're documenting. Great. So um, got some questions coming in here that we're going to um, transition to in just a moment. So Leanne, um, thank you again for putting together um, the document um, and the resources that we can, uh, we have loaded on the blog page and also they're accessible uh, to everyone on the uh, meeting now in the Zoom chat. But Leanne, can you share with us a couple of your sort of top uh, do's and don'ts that you've learned um, as we've been thrust into teledermatology? Yeah, you know, I think, I think number one do is absolutely you should try it. And whatever method you're most familiar with, um, as long as it's safe and it's amenable to the patient, you can document their consent, I think absolutely try it. It's certainly not appropriate for every diagnosis, um, but I think our patients are really, really voicing approval and uh, thankfulness that they can, in fact, continue their dermatologic care in the middle of a pandemic. I think do number two is when you're scheduling these televisits, really, really a great idea to schedule them in a block. And so while our in-office visits might be, be scheduled on the 15 or the 20, I really encourage you if you're gonna do, especially if you're gonna do both in-office and telemedicine visits, to schedule your telemedicine visits in a block schedule of maybe 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. or 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. It really gives you a little bit more flexibility so you're able to kind of juggle uh, doing both. Um, in terms of the don'ts, I would say don't write off telemedicine completely. As we've already alluded, I definitely think that uh, this is going to be here to, say, to stay as part of our new normal. And I think as Joe already alluded, um, we can really be thought leaders in terms of our ability to be efficient and to roll with the punches in the middle of this and um, the ability to actually see an in-office patient and alternate with a telemedicine visit really allows for us to allow our patients to socially distance. And it keeps our staff um, healthy as well. And then I think number two don't is don't be so, tick, so quick to discontinue it. I think um, one of the conversations I had with a patient today in the office was an Accutane patient who we consented and she was starting her first month. And you know, she made the comment, I'm just so thankful I don't have to be handed off when I go to school in the fall. If she gets to go, um, she's gonna in fact be able to continue to, to see us. And I think we've got a number of patients who are immune compromised and really appreciate the offering as well. Yeah, Leanne, thank you so much for those you know insights and sharing that with us. I think that the continuity of care that we're going to be able to extend uh, to the to our patients as they go off to school, especially as you can see by the survey results, acne was one of the top type of visits that we're seeing now, and we've been seeing through the years to be able to maintain a relationship with those patients. Uh, via teledermatology, assuming that your reimbursement stays the same as they transition off to college, that's going to be wonderful for them and for us as practitioners as well. So again, Leanne, thank you so much for your insights and helping us stay updated. So Kara, as I understand it, in Arizona, your office has a huge demand from patients wanting to be seen. Yet, uh, based on the logistical um, challenges and structural challenges and safety precautions that we've all uh, had to put in place um, and as they've been mandated and as we should be doing to keep our patients, ourselves, and our staff safe, can you tell us what it's like in your practice these days? Yeah, so we transitioned from primarily being telehealth last week, which we had been for the last several weeks, and only having one half day per week in the clinic to opening up this week 
with a reduced volume of patients. We had only been scheduling our patients out, or rescheduling them about one to two weeks. And so we actually had full schedules for this week, but we decided amongst our providers, and we're a very large group practice, we have eight locations and about 15 dermatology, NPs, PAs, and, and dermatologists, we decided that we wanted to start our schedule at about 50% volume. And so typically I see about five or six patients an hour and we have decreased that, we, we decreased it to three patients per hour. Really just trying to see how we would do with reduced staff and also keeping social distancing. And I can tell you my experience has been almost identical to TJ's where we do have difficulty with getting our staff back to work. There are some of them that just can't come back because their kids are doing online school. And then again, we do have the same issue with they're making more money staying at home than they would be in the clinic. And so that's the challenge that we face. And then we also had to let go some of our staff and then trying to hire people now is, is really challenging. So we are trying to next week open up to closer to full volume, which I have to be honest, I'm very skeptical about as we of the staffing issues that we're having. But the good news is that patients want to come in and see us. And so we didn't really know when we opened in Arizona what it was going to look like. I see a lot of Medicare age patients. I work mostly in a community that's a retirement community. And so we weren't really sure. But I will tell you, I think this week I've had of the four days that I've worked, I think I've had two patients that did not show up. So that's the great news. Um, next week will be challenging trying to get them into the clinics and, and keep them socially distanced and keep them <laughs> being seen in a timely manner. So, you know, it's, it's definitely an interesting time, challenging as, as we all can attest to with wearing masks all day long for eight, nine hours a day has, has been <laughs> tough. If anyone has a pearl on how to wear a mask, and not have your glasses fog, please email me or text me because I have not been able to figure that out yet. And I would love to, um, but it's, it's been good to be back and seeing patients in the office. Um, some just quick, funny stories. We do require our, mat, our patients to wear masks. And so they're, they're called ahead of time. We actually provide a link to them to make their own mask if they don't have access to one. And um, I've had a couple of very interesting masks come in. I had a guy who I've known for a very long time came in with a, a crown royal bag, the purple bag that he had attached some strings to. So that was, that was great. I also had an older gentleman today who came in with a dish towel that he had wrapped around his head and, and tied back with some rubber bands. So it's been, it's definitely been interesting. We'll see what happens in Arizona. We're opening up our hair salons, nail salons, and tattoo shops tomorrow, and then restaurants will be opening on Monday, which is they're very interesting. Our cases of COVID-19 are increasing in the state, and yet we are opening more places. So I'm not really sure what's going to happen. I think the, the governor feels confident that we can open more places because Right now, as of today, you can actually go onto the CDC website and you can get information on where the um, ICUs stand in your state. And so our ICUs in Arizona are only at 45% capacity. And so I think that's why they feel confident that we can open. And, and if we see an increased number of cases, we'll still be able to handle them. Sarah, that's great. We're being flooded with responses to help you with your um, fogging glasses dilemma. Um, <clears throat> I too have had that issue. Um, so one of my patients told me, um, when you put the glasses on, you put them on top of the mask, not under the mask. Um, that can help. And I think that makes a big difference. The other thing um, is uh, one of the tips we're getting here says that um, one of the things you can do with unfogging glasses is tuck a tissue into your mask to absorb the condensation and that keeps it from fogging up and we hope that helps um and then tj um do you want to weigh in on the fogging um issue looks like you've got some insight here yes uh actually our mohs surgeon taught me this um basically we take a, a piece of paper tape and you tape the top 
of the, um, uh, of the top of the mask to your nose. The only problem with that is you, you, you're not gonna be able to take off your mask very easily, but if you're gonna do like a surgery, it works great or a long procedure, it works fantastic. Or if you wanna keep it on all day that way, it works just as well. And it's, it stays on all day if you want it to. That's helpful. I did have a patient tell me that I could put shaving cream on my glasses. I haven't tried it yet, but she told me that that works. Well, let us let us know. We'll be, we'll be waiting to see how that works out. That's fantastic. So I think, yeah, as we all, we're all transitioning into this new normal, if you will, and continuing to share our experiences are going to help all of us adjust as we get back into clinic. And um, what's clear is that we're all sharing a lot of the same challenges. So by exchanging this information, we'll all be able to transition uh, much more easily, hopefully. Um, so I'm gonna get to some questions uh, from our um, attendees here. So um, this is um, a common issue that I think has come up uh, in some of our earlier um, calls. Uh, the question is from Bree. Um, and Bree says, I saw a news article about people getting angry that they were getting bills for telephone calls for medical visits that used to be free. So is everyone getting consent for billing by phone calls? So Bree, this is a big issue uh, in dermatology. We always would talk to patients on the phone and we never billed for that time. Um, if you've ever uh, uh, enlisted the services of an attorney, you will get billed for every 15 minute increment. But in medicine, uh, when we follow up with patients uh, or take their phone calls, we have not charged for them. So the transition to teledermatology was something that we had to um, massage with our patients gently so that they knew that this visit, this teledermatology visit, which is mostly going to be through one of the platforms that uh, we talked about earlier, Zoom, uh, Modernizing Medicine, uh, FaceTime, um, those are video exchange visits with our patients. And generally speaking, most offices have instituted a consent that the patient will be filling out prior to the visit so that they know that they're getting billed. So it's really important if you give them a heads up that the teledermatology visits are going to be billed and then they can choose whether they want to do it or not. And in general, um, they're so pleased and happy with the being able to get care during this time. They've been very uh, receptive to paying their copay and having the visit online. Um, we have another uh, comment here uh, from Val in um, Arizona. Val says, my dentist just added a $5 COVID appointment fee to cover costs of cleaning and preparing the office for patients. So, and that's something that we may see. Um, maybe we would get increased reimbursement uh, for our visits uh, from insurance companies uh, because of the extra work uh, that we have to do and potentially decrease volume uh, to take um, care of patients uh, with this new normal. And then um, there's a question from Morelia. She wants to know if your uh, office staff is wearing N95 masks, um, and if so, uh, how are they switched out? Um, I'm gonna <laughs> punt that to the panel, yeah, TJ. Uh, we, we all, the, our office manager gave us uh, five paper bags, five M95 masks, and we marked Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and we keep them in there and change them out every day. The reason we did that is uh, technically you can carry coronavirus on your mask from one day to the next. Uh, there's some research showing that. So we have one for every day of the week. Um, we, you know, we have the staff not wear, we ask them not to wear makeup from their mid face down so, so they don't get makeup all over the mask. Some of them are happy, some of them aren't. Um, but it's keeping the, the state of the masks pretty well. Oh, that's great. Um, Leanne is suggesting Rain-X for the uh, goggle issue to keep your glasses from fogging. Hey, love uh, <laughs> so um, I'm going to get to some more of these questions here. Um, there's one on Accutane, um, and it's asking about how do you uh, document pregnancy tests 
on Accutane patients. So one of the, um, th that's something that's really um, been well described. Um, the American Academy of Dermatology does have some resources. I've seen it done many different ways. Um, the patients have to do a pregnancy test at home. They have to show you the, the actual test with a negative reading. Um, I have seen some uh, uh, dermatology practices have the patient um, write on a piece of paper their name and birth date and hold that negative test up and screenshot it into their electronic medical record system so that they have that documented. You can um, you could do that. You could just, um, as long as you visualize it, you can um, record it as being done also. That's being accepted these days uh, through the iPledge program. That was a big update. Um, we got a question about um, nurse practitioners or physician assistants um, looking for internships or mentoring um, programs. Um, what I'm gonna do is suggest that you uh, visit the dermnppa.org website uh, because we do have a grant called the mentorship grant that may be uh, useful to you in terms of getting some dermatology experience. Um, and then there are, um, for in Florida, uh, this question is coming specifically from Florida, is it a bad time to apply uh, for a new position? Um, I think that uh, all of us realize that it's really tough to start a new job uh, right now. Um, it's hard for us to get our employees just to come to work um, these days. And so um, I think the key is um, we really want to make sure that um, you choose the right opportunities and evaluate all the resources because there are uh, really great training programs out there. Um, the question is, you know, how active are they right now? So um, let's move on to our next question. Okay, so TJ, uh, looks like this one's for you. Uh, what, uh, what is the high volume of patients that you see and how can you adequately clean the rooms between patients? Well, and that's where we have the staffing issue come into play. Um, we have uh, our front desk, we have a person who comes up from the front desk um, to clean the room actually. Um, and then they go then back up to the front um, and pull the patient back, not the medical assistant. And that's the way we've been able to ensure that the, the room is clean. And she's basically cleaning everything, the, 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 the bed very well, the, the table, the chairs, every single time. But there's no question that it's going gonna, it's gonna to slow us down. I'm not going to really find out how bad it's going to be until next week when I see 50 patients. And we try to do that um, successfully. Uh, but you have to, you have to absolutely clean the rooms between each patient. That is, that is something that you, that you could create liability for you um, if you don't do that appropriately. Yeah, what we're doing is we're having a team of uh, the medical assistants, they're sort of uh, working as teams, and as soon as the room opens up, that room gets clean, and they put a sign on it saying clean. Yeah. And so then we know what we have to work with. Um, so we have a few minutes left, and what I'd love to do is to transition to a discussion that we had uh, just prior to coming um, live onto the um, Zoom this evening. Um, and it's about uh, access for, um, for us uh, as nurse practitioners and physician assistants and being able to get samples for our patients because uh, samples are so important for our patients. And I think all of us know as our practices were either closed or uh, shut down or changed and access has been tremendously restricted, our sources of samples has dried up. Um, so I know that our industry partners are really wanting to provide um, help and access to medications for our patients. Um, maybe you can share some of the ways that you're interacting with industry uh, during, this, um, during these times. Leanne, did you wanna um, jump in on that? So we've done some web lunches uh, with some of our reps, which has been really helpful. I would just say my one comment would be to um, really detail ahead of time how much time is available. Um, 
So, you know, 30, 45 minutes probably isn't going to happen right now while you're juggling and trying to get caught up. Um, but definitely um, 15 minutes face to face is what I've been promising and really attempting to to give and it's worked out really, really well. Um, and I know, you know, in terms of just staff morale has been has really struggled through this and that really has been one of the things that they've looked forward to and um, and enjoyed as as part of part of the new normal. Uh, Kara, how's that going in your practice? Yeah, we've done similar things uh, to, with Leanne, as Leanne has. We've also had reps do, deliver through DoorDash, Starbucks, which I agree, Leanne, it is, it's a struggle with our staff right now. I think everyone is stressed out. Everyone's got kids at home that they're worried about. And just those little things that I'll be honest with you, I missed when I was at home. I was like, I miss my Starbucks, you know, a couple times a week being delivered with my nectar juice. So those <laughs> To help keep the staff morale up and I agree um, I worked well we did a lunch yesterday and had about 15 minutes and and it was great so we do appreciate that very much and I have also have had several of the reps reach out and we've been able to do some online ordering for samples so that's been super helpful as well yeah I think that um, you know we've I've set up some group uh, text between our office staff and logging our reps in as well um, so that we can get access to uh, samples for the patients. Um, some of the reps just can't be in the field right now. So keeping that line of communication open is important. I think we also need access to the medical science liaisons from the companies uh, during this time as everything uh, continues to be fluid. Uh, new articles are being published that are going to affect the way we practice on a daily basis. Um, so it's really important that we continue to keep the dialogue open and share information so we can pool our resources. Um, <clears throat> so I want to take the last few minutes just to talk about, I think, the challenge that we're all experiencing um, as we sort of have ha had to leave our offices and work from home. And I don't know about you guys, but how, how do you balance this, the sanity of like for instance, we're in a room now. What are your kids doing? How do you balance, you know, online schooling and telemedicine or these webinars? I mean, it's a real struggle. Um, can you share with uh, the audience? You know, really wants to know uh, how we're getting through this. So, uh, TJ, Kara, Leanne, do you have any um, pearls of wisdom for us? Well, I'm married and I have a great wife, so. I'll, I'll leave it to Kara. <laughs> my, my husband works from home, and so he's been the, the teacher primarily, which has been, it's, it's been great, although it's very, very stressful. It's a new role, and um, the kids don't love it, and, and they don't love their teacher anymore either. So, but thankfully, it's, it's nice and toasty hot. It's 100 degrees here, so we're able to throw our kids in the pool. And then during, at night, it cools down, so we've been able to go out and bike ride and do walks, but it's, I'll tell you, um, Xbox, FaceTime, you know, lots of time on there. That's the only way sometimes that we can all get our work done. And unfortunately it's just the way it is. There's a sign on my door that says office hours. And unfortunately, um, you know, I have to have that up when I'm doing visits and I try really hard to make sure I pull it down after um, and just to give them, you know, time one-on-one -on -one is, is it, it really has been a blessing. Yeah, I think it's really important that we, um, you know, if, if the weather allows it and you can get outside uh, with the kids and do whatever it is, spend some time with them. It's super important. And, you know, we do have time at home with them now. And uh, we're challenged because all of our other responsibilities are ongoing. And so one of the things that I think is really important for all of us is to try to unplug uh, completely from other things uh, and spend some real, you know, one-on-one -on -one time connecting with the kids and our spouses uh, because these are unprecedented times and we're experiencing challenges um, on levels that we never could have imagined. So I think it's really important for us uh, to communicate openly 
with our families, answer their questions, address their fears. Um, and so as things change, we can all be on the same page and we can provide uh, the resources and um, everything necessary um, to you know, meet the needs of our you know, family and our spouses. So um, <clears throat> it's so great to see everyone. I see lots of uh, familiar faces. Um, I see Jamie Heim with her headphones on, looking amazing in her office. <laughs> and her husband is on the other side of the desk. I know that. I'm looking for Dwayne Wade. Oh, there he is. Dr. Glick, so glad to see you tonight. So everyone, you know, please uh, continue to send in suggestions of topics that you want to hear about. Uh, we will address them in next week's webinar. There's Val from Arizona. Great to see you, Val. Um, and we want to um, thank our panelists again for taking time out of their schedules to do this and share their experiences with us. There is a lot of late breaking information, um, clinical information and articles that have been published just over the last few days that we're gonna bring next week. We're also gonna provide some updates to some of the um, cases that we've presented in previous webinars. So uh, Leanne, Kara, TJ, thank you so much for taking time to share with us. Um, everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again next week on our uh, DEF uh, video series. NPPA.org, uh, DermNPPA.org, uh, visit that uh, to check the blog page and you can see the resources that were mentioned on tonight's call. So with that, oh, we've come to an end. Uh, everyone have a great evening and happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there this coming weekend.